I was just telling our very special guest off air, Doss, that if if you went back to when I was 10 years old and you said I'd be sitting across from my favorite tennis player, I would have said you're joking. So I'm so, so excited <laughs> for this. Mark Philippoussis, welcome to the Doss and D Show. Guys, thank you so much for having me. How, how's life, mate? We didn't realize you're, you're from Torquay now. Did, did yeah. you have a surf this morning? What was didn't the morning have a like? Surf, um, woke up, took the dog for a long walk, little um, exercise with the dog, and get the kids ready for school, oh, yeah. school drop off, and then made my way down here. Mate, we are, we're, we're so grateful. Talk to us a bit about that lifestyle out that way. When did you move out sort of coastway? Um, we moved with the family three years ago. Okay. Just over, just over three years ago. And, and I had a place, you know, I lived, since I was 18, lived in the States. But when I came back, I had a place in Anglesey for maybe 15 years. So I've always loved this coast, especially... I think being a Western suburbs boy, if you go to the coast, it's normally you stay this side of the bridge. <laughs> yes. And if you're on the other side, you're kind of Mornington, which is also beautiful. That's um, where we're from, actually. Yeah. yeah. So that's um, so naturally it was just easier for me. And, and so I've always loved that part of, 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 of Victoria. And when we moved back with the family to Australia in 2019, our goal was definitely uh, we're in Williamstown, but we always knew that we'd end up down that way because kids were born in San Diego and wanted to give them a similar lifestyle as possible um, and just being having the coast that we love the family loves the ocean um the beach and unfortunately you know we don't have the consistency of the weather in san diego <laughs> but there's some beautiful um beach down that way and we love it it's, it's just great for the family um great schooling um you know it's building it's building out a lot talk mm. changed so much over the years and it's building so much but it's a it's a beautiful lifestyle and i like the community over there do you love being back? Like, it, obviously, was it part of the original plan to yeah. bring the kids back? It was always the plan because the great thing is, even though I met my wife in the States, she originally was born in Romania but moved to Melbourne when she was three years old oh. with a family, and she's eastern suburbs. So the great, it was just simple. Once my son got to five, we can start school back here. I um, mean, he started schooling in, in the States, and, and we knew we'd always come home because we wanted to be – you know, have the, have the kids grow up with their family and we mm. want it to be next to our family yeah. as it's um, a priority for us. Is that uh, dual passports for the kids then? Yeah. That'll come in very handy. They're lucky. Yeah. They've got the dual passports, <laughs> yes. They've got the, um, the, the Aussie US passports, yes. That's awesome. Well, you've just played recently the Australian Open. How, how are you hitting them these days? How would you rate yourself on the court? You're obviously an incredible Nick still, um, but how was the Australian Open for you? Uh, it was – I love it because – you, I really have the opportunity to enjoy it now. Whereas mm. when you played, there was just stress. You were getting ready for the Australian Open. There was, you know, you had that amazing support, but you also had all the pressure that came with it as well, on and off the court. And um, it's very difficult to enjoy anything. You know, you don't want to walk around at night. You, you just eat room service or something close because you don't want to walk around too much and, and you want to stay relaxed and like I said just keep the legs fresh and now you get I get an opportunity to walk around and, and, and see the incredible setup and it's grown so much and it's changed so much over the years and what they're offering now not only to the players and their teams but the spectators the fans I mean it's, it's incredible what they've built over there and and so it's great because um I'm still getting a chance to get on the court and play. I played three matches, three doubles matches, two doubles and a mixed. Um, no pressure, just a pure enjoyment of playing the game and still having the excitement of being out and playing on those center courts um, without all stress involved. Um, and look, when the ball's there to hit, I can hit the ball. Yeah. <laughs> you know, getting yeah, yeah. to the ball <laughs> is a whole other thing. But um, again, the great thing is we – our matches are, you know, hit and giggle stuff. Yeah. You know? yeah. We don't want to be serious. I mean, shit, these guys are watching the best in the world be serious. So it's <laughs> before we get out on the come, like, guys, let's have fun. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, we have an opportunity to entertain the crowd, to make them laugh, you know, to incorporate them somehow if we can. But just, yeah, just enjoy it. So it was good. Did you find that actually now that you're older, did you wish you laughed and had a bit more fun back when you were younger? Because obviously when you're working, you're working. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Look, when I was, I enjoyed myself. I, I had a great team. I always, I had the best years and the most, the best results when I had one of my closest friends child with me. And I knew that because he relaxed to me. He brought a piece of home with me, even though my dad was my coach. You know, having that close friend 
he, without trying, would joke around and, and then relax me, you know, before matches or the night before instead of thinking about the next day, you know. So um, when I went on the court, I was that type of guy that I didn't want to get too emotional because or angry because certain athletes might play better with aggression and I wasn't that person that got the best out of myself if I was angry you know so I knew I had to be relaxed and calm when I played on the court and that I got my best tennis out of myself when I was relaxed and calm and of course there were times when you'd, you'd be pissed and something but he wouldn't I wouldn't just bitch and moan the whole time he would just I wouldn't say a word and then if it got to that point build I would you know, disintegrate the racket, put it away, and then I was, I was calm again, <laughs> you know? Disintegrate and then, it. You know, and then I was happy to move on. So, um, but, yeah, I, I was definitely that person that, that stayed calm on the court, you know? And I did enjoy myself, you know? There were definitely times when I showed some emotion, but I tried to show positive emotion, um, you know, whenever I could, and, uh, yeah. Do you? What's your relationship with tennis now as purely as a spectator do you enjoy watching it and when you kind of look now do you if you compare the eras that you you played in compared to nowadays do you would do you, do you think you'd prefer to play nowadays or back then for i don't know what reason whether it's um exposure whether it's social media the talent on the court which era do you think you'd prefer to be in if you had the choice well i believe i personally feel that we that i played in the best era mm-hmm. um you know, uh, back when I played, incredible, ridiculous players, incredible um, characters, you know, such individuals. Um, and the great thing is the courts were the courts. Hardcourt was a hardcourt, played like a hardcourt. Clay played like clay. Grass played like grass. The indoors played like indoors, whereas now they all play the same okay. because they've slowed down the court a lot because they wanted rallies. You know, and and that changed years ago, and and in every, almost every surface is the same now. Mm-hmm. You know, even grass is a different kind of grass than when when we played back then. It's a slower grass. You can have twenty shot rallies on grass now, thirty shot rallies, just like a hard court. When you couldn't do that before, mm. you know, but that should have been. That's how it should be. Like if you're training your butt off and you're working on that serve and you're working on that serve and volley. When it's time for grass, and you only had two, three tournaments of the year on grass, let's leave it to grass. Yeah. So the person that's worked on his serve and volley has an advantage because now it's grass court season. Now that person for the French Open and all the other tournaments before that on clay, they you know didn't play at their best because they're playing on clay. Now the other guys who have worked on their ground strokes and the you know, the spins and, and grounding, grinding from the back and they're moving on the clay and they're sliding into the ball. Now they've got an advantage. Great. You know, and that's, the, that's in my opinion, how it should be. Mm. Um, whereas now, you know, those guys, um, you know, they're very comfortable on all surfaces because they all play the same. Yeah. And they're all consistent on all surfaces. Whereas back when I was playing, you had guys that were top 10 in the world from Spain who would not play Wimbledon because also one of the things back then too you were ranked Wimbledon ranked you you weren't ranked on your world oh really world ranking if Pete was injured and he moved to th- five that can put him seated two in the tournament you know or there's really? other players or there's other players who was number two like number three or Musta when he was number two or three in the world Musta they were put to eight or six or five yeah okay even those two so and a lot of the guys knew that and they actually would not play Wimbledon, truth, because they knew that they'd lose first round and they mm. thought, he's, you know, after the French Open, here's my chance to physically have a rest and maybe get ready for the hard court season where I've got more of an opportunity because I've got no opportunity on grass. And a lot of the top players that were clay court specialists would actually not even turn up, to wow. yeah, which is crazy. So, and, and, and coming back to why I believe... I'm happy when I, I played at the best time is also technology. Um, we didn't have to worry about, we didn't have the technology, you know. So when we went on the court, we played, the cameras were there. But when we got off the court, we can relax and do what we wanted. You know what I mean? Um, whereas now you can't get away. Um, it must be incredibly difficult to play now 
as an athlete, forget about tennis, as an athlete in general, because there's two spectrums, right, to technology and the social media. It can be incredibly positive, it, it can be a beautiful thing, or it can be just negative and, and, and brutal, you know, and destructive. It depends how it's used. For an athlete, it's a great opportunity to let people get to know you personally and, and when you follow someone, you get to know them, even though if you haven't met them, what are they, what's the content they're putting out? What are the words they're using? You know, Instagram is a little different. That's just pictures, but are they posting photos of their family? Uh, you know, or kind of they get to know what kind of the person they are, or are they just things going out all the time? Is are they drinking photo? You know, just, mm. but you do get to know them, you know, at a certain level because you're letting them inside your life, in, inside to getting a piece of who you are. Um, and the same thing on Twitter. What are they posting? What are they saying? You know, um, are they political or, or, or what? What are their passions or where's their mindset? And and but then you can get abused and attacked too. If someone doesn't like you for whatever reason, they don't like it. They just don't mm -hmm. like you. And the, and the worst thing is you got these people that I call cowards because they don't have a picture when they're abusing you. It's plain there's a name you know you don't know who they are but they'll say something you know terrible and 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 you know as you go through life you realize that the unfortunately these people are hurting you know if you're in a, if you're somebody who don't know somebody else and you're going to go out of your way and write something terrible about someone they, these people are obviously not in a good place in their lives because if you are in a good place, you're focused on you, you're focused on getting better, you're focused on doing better for yourself, for your family, right? Um, but if you're hurting in your life, then unfortunately it's easy to hurt somebody else. Of course, yeah. Right? Um, because you also want to take some, you know, some of that, that focus off yourself because you're miserable. So mm. let's let me focus on someone else. So we never had to worry about any kind of abuse or you know, things like that. And when we did switch off, you could switch off and get away. Now you've got phones yeah. on cameras, man, anywhere. My God, you can't do anything. And even if you're being polite and saying hello to somebody, if you get that picture on a certain angle, it could look completely different <laughs> to what actually, you know what I'm trying yeah. to say? Yeah. Like yeah. a fan, uh, a female comes up to you just w and it happens to kiss you on the cheek and you turn, you know, like nice to me and they say the nicest and whatever it is. Yeah. Someone takes a picture on a certain angle, looks like you're going for a kiss. Yeah. And what happens if that person has his partner or he or her partner at home? You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's definitely brutal and very difficult now, a lot more difficult without a doubt um, to kind of step away from what you want to do. So we had a chance to play and, and do our thing on the court. But when we stepped away, we could actually get away. Whereas now it's incredibly difficult. So for a lot of reasons, um, quite a few reasons, I believe, played at the best era. It's, I find that it's, it's spot on or so true and we've had other athletes on say the same thing when it comes to social media. But I'd love to, the, the earlier question or the earlier answer talking about, I didn't know that about the changing of the courts to now yeah. they're all the same. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. Did you, what I gathered from what you were saying and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, this is what I'm thinking, is someone like a Novak wouldn't be the, you know, the, how big he is and how many Grand Slams he's won based on, if all the courts were different, like he couldn't play, not him specifically, but like we've seen so many long like runs. Rafa, Rafa right. Roger, Novak, even Andy Murray for a certain period of time. There was that top four for a good four, 10 years right, that right. didn't change. Is that why? Oh, look, those guys. Not taking anything away from them. No, I mean, look, Djokovic would still be winning shitload of grand slams because he's that good. Yeah. And, and you, okay, you've named four of the greatest of all time. And <clears throat> especially those three. Djokovic, um, uh, Nadal, and Federer. And when you're talking about greatest of all time, it's a very personal thing. So you ask somebody, if they love Roger, it's going to be Roger. If they love Rafa, it's going to be Rafa. If they love Djokovic, it's going to be Djokovic. But now if we talk about numbers, it's a totally different story. If you yeah, want to go on numbers, so yeah. right? Yeah. And you can't argue numbers. And Djokovic is pretty much leading most of them without a doubt he definitely has most of them and i think i believe by the time he's done might be ahead in all of them but he's done he hasn't done some incredible things he's been close but the grand slam mm. rod Leva's has done that twice yeah 
Steffi, uh, Steffi Graf has done the Golden Slam. She's won all four in that same year, including the Olympics gold medal. That's that the same. Year. Yeah. That's, you know, that's ridiculous. Now, there's certain things that he might not do. He, he still has. He's been close twice. Twice he's won three and lost in the final of the last one. Mm. You know what I mean? So, um, that's, you know, that's a different thing. And then the difference with the greats is the mindset. Now, who else but the great, the, the best in the world, for instance, are winning 14, 15 grand slams and then still thinking, how can I improve? What can I do to get better? Tweaking their serve. Ruff has won 18 grand slams and he's tweaking his serve. He's changing his grip a little bit to get his serve a little bit flatter, to have a little bit more in the serve. He's working on – Djokovic would work on his volleys a lot more, bring a coach in just for the volleys and work on the volleys and do that. Federer ended up knowing that, you know, they're getting to me on the backhand side. What did he do? Not only did he work on the backhand side, but he had – he worked so closely with Wilson, his sponsor, to create a racket for him to be easier, hit a backhand easier and not miss it as much as he used to. So they created a racket that was built around him to, he, to make his backhand side easier, yeah. but still not changing the feeling of what he had on all these other strokes. So the racket head got bigger, you change the racket, you know, maybe things are strings as well. So these guys were still looking at improving, even when they were the best winning all the grand slams. So when you're talking about those three, they still would have found ways back mm. then, you know, if they haven't been playing in that era. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I must say it's disappointing because I bought, you know, would have bought a Wilson growing up. Thought I had the same one as Roger. Yeah, Clearly I yeah. didn't. He had his own. So, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, um, but then look at not – let's forget about those guys for a second and look at who played. You had Sampras, right? He won the Australian Open mm -hmm. a whole bunch of times. Wimbledon, you know how much you won Wimbledon. And the US Open. He never won the French Open. Mm. He got close semi-finals because that's how good he was. But that's how different it was. Yeah. Or you had uh, you had Musta win a whole bunch of um, French Opens, um, and not nothing nothing at Wimbledon. Okay, nothing really at the hard courts. Okay, but he was just that clay court specialist and a whole bunch of Mon Monte Carlos and Italian Opens and all that. You know. Then you had um, Ivanisevic that you know, was dangerous on all surfaces, but grass, you know, he two, three finals and he finally won that Wimbledon, you know, and did okay. You know, it was tough in the Australian Open and that, but, but not really the, the clay, you know. Mm. So he had certain guys that were known for for, for those surfaces mm. and because their games naturally were just more dangerous on those surfaces because that's how they trained, that's how they grew up and that's what you can see – that's what their dream was to win that that tournament, right? So they based their game around that tournament. I mean, there are other guys who had great all-round games who were dangerous on all surfaces, but didn't end up winning any of those grand slams. You know what I yeah. mean? So it's, it's it's interesting. Yeah. This episode of the Dawson D Show is brought to you by Fleet Plant High Solutions. Oh yes, we couldn't do the show without them, and they are the absolute best in the business, both on the field and off. Imagine the biggest projects. Mm -hmm. I'm talking roads. Hit me. Railways. Hit me. Bridges. Yes. Everything everything that needs to be built, FBH, they do it all. And the best part about them is their customer service. Chris and the team will look after you. Their care is just second to none. So visit fbh.com.au right now to get involved. Let's get back into the episode with Mark Philippoussis. Oh, yes. I'm interested in to know now, do you have, because right now in Australia, it seems to be like we're getting a really good wave of, of players, both on in the men's and the women's coming through the ranks. Do any of them reach out to you that are currently on tour um, for advice or for, well, for anything? Um, Do you have a relationship with any of them? No, the but I have a relationship with them, you know, and, and, and my door's are always, always there, you know, especially now that, you know, I'm not coaching anyone and, and, and doing the commentating because when you're sitting in the commentating booth, we get all the information at our fingertips as far as percentages of, of where they're hitting the ball, where they're going on their big shots, how high are they hitting the ball over the net, what's their spin ratio, how flat are they hitting the ball. You know, so there's certain things and, and, and there might be one or two that come up and, and or I'd say, you know, look, man, bad luck. Or there was a coach that reached out to one of the Aussie players and going, look, can, do you mind if I know you commentated for his match? I'd love to get your thoughts. And I sent him a five minute WhatsApp, vi you know, wow. voice message on what I believe, what I saw, <clears throat> what I believe mm. he needs to do to get to that next level. The things he did right and the things he should have done and the big points, you know, so... 
um, if someone reaches out to me, which they have, I, I, I love to be able to help people. You know, it, it makes me feel good, you know, especially when I do believe that I have something to offer and I could help, you know, I definitely do um, give them my time. Yeah. You, know. well, you mentioned coaching. What's it like being in a box? Like we, we see on TV the coaches and, and the support team in the box and you've obviously been a part of many different teams. Um, you know, when you were watching on TV and you guys are sitting in the box – what, what, do you guys talk? Is it very quiet, obviously, to an extent? But what actually, because you're obviously going with a plan, but it's up to them now to do it. Well, I've only coached one player, and that's Tsitsipas. Um, I did, when I wasn't working with Tsitsipas, I did do three tournaments on the grass to with Maria Sakari, who reached out to me and said, um, you know, uh, do you mind helping me out in the grass court season? And I happened to be at Wimbledon doing exhibition, so I ended up, I ended up helping her, but... I can only really comment properly because I was, you know, a year and a half almost, uh, you know, definitely a solid year and a half, almost two years with Tsitsipas and his team. And it's stressful. Mm. It's stressful. It's definitely easier playing because you're in control. Being in the box, even though now you're allowed to coach. Yeah. Okay, so you're allowed to coach in, in, in um, you know, definitely put more information out there. Um, but your role as a coach and helping is, is doing the best you can and doing all the work off the court and the practice courts. That's, that's what you do and putting in a position. So when they do step out in the court, you know, you've done your role. There's nothing else to do. Yes. You can maybe say one or two things when you're now you're in a box and watch his wide serve on the big, you know, he's going, he's going out to your forehand on the big serve. Just, and this one, just lean one step further on the right, you know, give him that down the tee a little bit more or, or watch his forehand down the line, or he likes to pass you, cross court on the back end he goes back end so certain things that because as a player you're so got tunnel vision and you got the blinkers on that you sometimes you do you're so focused on yourself that it's easier to miss things that are clear that your opponent's doing you know at times yeah. so it, that's that's what you should be putting across you don't want to say too much because you don't want to you know there's so many things that end of the day you have to focus on you that player has to focus on themselves and if you're telling him 20 things of what the opponent's going to do they're going to forget about what they should do. So I believe the best thing is, okay, my focus with my player when I was with him was focus on those two things, one or two things on your serve, on your service games, one or two things on your return of serve games, and on big points. Focus on one or two things we're doing the, on the big points. And then I would say, okay, on, on that, your opponent on his service games or his serve, he likes to do that on his serve. In his points, he's going to push you here and, and put some pressure on your backhand and, and watch, don't open up that backhand too much. Or if you look to run around your forehand, to run around that backhand and hit that forehand, you're going to leave that down line backhand open, which is your forehand too much. You know, that can put some pressure yep. on you. So certain, I like to keep it as simple as possible. Um, but I was in a, you know, that team where the father was, was the prime, he was the main coach. And, and he was an intense person, but I think also, too, being a father for an athlete is very intense. It's very difficult. My son, he's just turned 10 and he plays basketball. Man, it's, I get stressed watching him play basketball <laughs> and he plays under, under 12. Yeah. So watching your child play at the best level in 1% of the sport is, must be incredibly stressful, yeah. right? So he brought on a lot of energy to the box. So my job was, I believed... I had to bring in an energy that would calm him down, that would level off that energy that we needed in the box to help the player. You know, so he brought in a lot of energy. He said a lot of things. I didn't want. I didn't want to add any time. Didn't want to say anything. I don't want to all of a sudden add something because he's not saying anything. So I did add certain things, but I had to be very conscious of when I was adding it because I had, didn't want to give. You know, the kids getting so much energy, um, and and and. and words put at him so i it was very important for me to 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 calm the sea you know to just to be a calming energy and just m end up becoming kind of that perfect balance yeah the balance yeah it's, it's important to have that balance you know mm. you um you mentioned a couple of times uh, in a prior question about um downtime basically between between tournaments or between games and i'm sure we'll chat at some stage about Wimbledon and the US Open and I know how passionate you are about Davis Cup but um, in those tournaments like a Wimbledon for example where let's talk about the run you went on where you, you made the final 
Um, how, what, what does a day's off look like? Like in terms of when you're going deep into a tournament, how do you have downtime, calm yourself down? I'm really interested because we don't ever, that's the part we don't see as spectators. Uh, well, look, once you get into that second week, you know, you um, sorry, you know, you already played three matches. Did I, what was one of them a best of five at that time? No, there was like a two four setters and a three setter getting into the round of 16 before I played Agassi. So, you know, grass is, is I'm serving volume first and second serve. That's, that's what my game is. So I'm, I'm a big guy. I'm six, four, six, five. So when you're serving volleying, being a big guy, long legs, you need to get down for the volleys. You're mm-hmm. getting down, you're getting pushed out, you're going back for smashes and you're bending. So grass puts a lot of pressure on your glutes and your lower back yeah. and your glutes, right? Um, because you're in that getting down and up in that position. So, my, my days off was, was getting a massage and, and, of course, getting on the court for 20 minutes, but get, having an ice bath. So that was, that was a huge for me. Um, just, I, just whatever it took to recover the body. Now, I didn't need to spend a lot of time on the practice court because my, I was hitting the ball well. You know, I just had to keep the movement, you know, get out and hit some ground strokes, hit some serves, hit some volleys, just keep, that, keep the momentum going on, the, and on, on, on the game. But the biggest thing was recovering for the body and coming back fresh for the next match, you know. And then especially that second week when all of a sudden I played Agassi and I, and I think it was 6-3 in the fifth I beat him. That was, that was a longer match. Um, but then the next match quarterfinals was down two sets to love and I won in five sets. Yeah. I think it was eight, six in the fifth. Um, so, and, and then it recovery again. And then one of my uh, semifinal was a straight set win. Um, so, but it's just about recovery for the body. You know, you're eating the same kind of things because it's also as a athlete, we are definitely superstitious. Uh, I didn't like changing too many things. Um, and, and, and again, I had a close friend with me. I would, would rent a house always for Wimbledon. So I had a house for, for the month of Wimbledon. Walking distance it was literally across the road from, from Wimbledon. And we'd walk there in, in three minutes. And, and, and it was about being relaxed. So it was watching a movie or I think at the time, one of the first things I used to do was, especially at Wimbledon, was buy um, an, an Xbox, you know, and just yeah. keep it so I can just relax. And, you know, back then just do something, whatever it was to relax me not to not think of tennis because there's so much going on during that time not only for the matches and and the press and your sponsors we end with agents that i really wanted to it was very important for me to switch off so it was just finding what it was that not got me thinking about tennis so you're not um watching potential opponents definitely not watching okay. definitely okay. not watching um wow. i was that type of guy maybe i'd watch you know if that match there was a match that had to, um, you know, I was playing the winner of yeah. maybe a little bit, but I didn't want to think too much. I knew everyone knows how each other, pl- you know, how everyone plays. And also, more importantly, I had a very aggressive big game. And, and to be truthful, most of the time, if not all the time, the match came down to my racket. You know, I dictated the play wh- with whoever I played with in the world. Um, it was very important for me to, to play the game on my terms, you know, and, and I had the weapons to do that, um, whereas, and, and it started off with my serve. You know, I can come to the net or I can hit, you know, big from the back. So I had the luxury of dictating the play. So it was very important for me not to overthink what my opponent did because I, um, I learned from a young age when I was a rookie that I overthought, my, I was thinking so much about my opponent and ended up having the worst matches because I forgot about what I had to do. So I knew that I just had to focus on my game um, and what I had to do. And, and of course, you would react and your opponent had his, his plan as well. But that was the biggest thing was focus, focusing on what I had to do. Is, is it true that I think did, – did, was Todd Viney your – one of, like one fitness of your co- fitness yeah, coach yeah. for a while. Strengthening coach. Yeah, so did you know that? No. Yeah, so Todd Viney, like well-known AFL footballer, played for Melbourne, champion footballer, um, all around good guy now at North Melbourne, head of footy. But so, how did that come about? Because that seems like so. Are you an AFL lover yourself? Um, I love. I love. I didn't play at all. I really enjoy watching. I love you know watching game and have respect because these guys are such incredible athletes of what they do. Um, but he actually had a tennis background. I don't know if you knew I that. I think I did know. He that. actually did yeah. some coaching on the side too. Coached some juniors, like little kids. Yeah, yeah. 
um, and he can hit a ball. Like he traveled with me for a little bit and would would warm me up for some time for some matches sometimes. Wow. Okay. Um, and I want to say, <clears throat> I'm trying to look. It's sad that I forgot exactly how the introduction happened, but it was definitely back at home, and I was looking to do some fitness, and he had he was coming towards the end of his career when he was playing for Melbourne. Mm. And I ended up doing some work with, and he started off doing some preseason work, which, and I just loved, he, I really enjoyed him as a person and his energy. It just, I felt very comfortable around him. Not only, and, and more importantly, he knew his thing, like he knew yeah. his fitness. And also I love the fact that he had that tennis background. So it was very important. All the work we did associated to on the court, you know, did it take you through, like, was it tennis-specific training? I'm just trying to think. Like, footy pre-seasons are tough. Yeah, like, he pushed me. It was very yeah. physical, but he made it specific for tennis. Yeah. Like, it couldn't be specific yeah. for, for, no, of course. for football, yeah. right? So, he was specific for tennis, but he brought that mentality of football in which was tough mentality, you know what yeah. I mean? Um, and like I said, he traveled with me, and we were very, like, we won events together. Like, we were very... Um, successful so he's a hell of a guy yeah, yeah. interesting it's funny when you said todd Viney, i thought you made a mistake i thought Jack. you meant todd woodbridge oh, no, no, I, no. I was about to jump in yeah. um can you debunk a tennis myth for us um because i'm this is something that i can't get my head around does everybody share the same locker room yes now well, <laughs> yes. how does that how does that yes I feel now like i mean look things have grown locker rooms have grown they've you know the tournaments have built up but now on ground slams, you almost have like two locker rooms as well. You have the locker room for the the, the seated, you know, the main players, oh, really? and then there's another locker room as well. But you mostly Australian Open has one locker room, um, and then there's another locker room for coaches. So that way, there's room. You know, you can you can coach coaches and and um, <coughs> the legends players. We have our own space. You don't you know have to worry about kind of because it gets so full. Like oh, yeah. you know, everyone has an entourage now, so true. and there's so many people. You know, so. It's very important, you know, they want to give these players space. Wimbledon has two locker rooms. He has a seated locker room and an unseated locker room. Okay. Um, it's the only one that does that. Um, the French Open and, and US Open is, yeah. is just one locker room. So how does it work then if you're literally, I'm thinking of night matches, right? And we've, we've seen these long epic, uh, let's talk Australian Open over the years, but where, where games go on longer than you'd expect and you're waiting and you warm up and then oh, there's a break and then he or she wins a set and now we've got to wait another hour before we play. Are you literally like... Stopping and starting warming up? Yeah, but also are you with, are you looking across at your opponent or are you no. constantly make, making... No, <laughs> no okay. you are, look, you're aware that that person's there and you, you've normally got your own space at that time. You know, you've got your own space. They've got their yeah. own space. Even sometimes you might be playing the opponent and, and their locker happens to be too, oh. too down. So I find that that's will, so strange. But that person, like if, if I happen to be already there, that person will grab your stuff and go gotcha. around the corner. Oh, you know see, what I mean? yeah, yeah. Um, but <clears throat> that happens, man. That happens. You, so you're not sitting there chatting, commenting about the game in no, front of you. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. Um, you're starting to slowly get in that zone. Yeah. You know? And and especially like for Wimbledon when there's – with the rain delays, now they've got roofs on yeah. the court. But man, there could be times when you're warming on and off for a day and a half. Cause <laughs> yeah. you, were, you know, And you won't yeah. go on for a day and a half and you're waiting. And that's the worst. Uh, they'll – They'll get a set up and, and, and it'll be, you know, two sets to love and, like, you start to warm up. All of a sudden, the guy loses the third set and then he's down a break and then you stop the warm up. Like, oh, he's down the break. And then he gets the break back and, like, you start warming up again then he loses the set and then you get <laughs> back. Yeah, and then yeah. it starts raining. I mean, that happens all the time. You just yeah. – that's something you just learn to, to get used control. to. But it happens all the time, especially in Grand Slams because it's, if you're – before a woman's match, you could be over quickly, but it's best of three yep. the most. Um, and women's is, it's normally one way or the other. It's like, it could be done in 50 minutes or it's three hours <laughs> yeah, a lot of the time, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. with a man's it's best of five. You can kind of get an idea of depending on who's playing and, and who's playing on the women's side, you've got an idea, you know, are they ground strokers? Are they just going to stay back and grind and hit 20 shot, 30 shot rallies every single point? Then, you know, you've got a little more time. Yeah. So it depends That's on hard. who's, who's on the court before you as well, but then you've got to be prepared if someone could get injured. Yeah. You know, um, and, and pull out, you know. Yeah, so. true. Dee, should we jump into the first the one? First segment, yeah. Well, uh, do you want to maybe, I'll get this up and do you want to explain what we're doing? Because we're doing something a little bit different for this We segment. thought we'll tailor this uh, <laughs> towards Mark. So being the tennis grader years, we want to build your ideal tennis player. Mm -hmm. So 
basically we wrote down a list of say attributes and I guess accessories that, that, that players might have. So whether that be hair or rackets or certain things that are part of who they are as a character. But you mentioned we start off with, oh, well, first we'll go the ad read. So why don't you read who our partner is? Yeah, so this segment is brought to you by our good friends at the Virtual Expo. If you want eyes on your business, this is the place to be and all you need is an internet connection. Visit www.theexpo.com.au to get involved today and we'll explain what that means shortly. So essentially, Mark, we got, I'll count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We got ten. Okay. Ten different which I went through before with you. We don't want you to think too much on this one. It's more of a, off the top of your head, who... In, so we'll start off with court surface. So let's go... What would I guess your, it doesn't really matter now. Every, every, oh, well, there you let's go. Let's just go to complete play. Everything plays the same. Okay. Right. Okay, let's keep it simple. Okay, so we'll start from the start. So the ideal... And this can be male, female, all in one. So let's go... Any, f- any, any, anybody any, ever. Any, any error? Any, well, let's, uh, let's keep it to current and Mark's error. Okay. So we yep. won't go all the okay. way to Rod Laver yet. So let's go forehand. Oof. That's a tough one. Forehand. There's a lot of guys who had some, um, there's some big forehands out there, right? There's big, then there's good shape. Forehands. <coughs> Look, one of the, it's a tough one. <laughs> but, but I want to I mix this around, right? Of course. Yeah, I, 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 I want to put a caveat I'm on gonna it. Say, say a few names if you want. I'm going to say just big heaviness del potro was one of the del, oh yeah, yeah. del potro i haven't heard, del potro I haven't heard is that one name of the in biggest, a long time because i could also have said rougher as well because rougher the rpms the way it kicks off the court is just so heavy you know so different stories so pace wise and and that certain thing del potro, del potro and yeah. what we'll put a caveat you can't say the same player twice yeah Two no categories. problem All okay right. you go. backhand sure man djokovic yeah really i thought uh, you might have been federer no, 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 okay. no way. Um, if you're <laughs> <laughs> Shows no, how much I know. <laughs> I, I, um, top spin for a top spin, Djokovic. Okay, yeah, okay. They just, just it's so freaking solid, man, Djokovic. Now this next one, I will we'll allow you to throw yourself in there. Uh, a serve. Uh, I'm gonna. I have to throw. Myself. Of course, you yeah. have to put no, yourself like in that. there. Yes. You have to. So you serve it, but then who's coming up for the volley? Volleys. I'm gonna say rafter volleys. Okay, rafter. Yep. And then choice of racket. Oh, that's just a very personal thing. I played what, what, my whole, I played play my whole career with a with a um, with a head. Uh, that's my head favorite prestige yeah. racket. Yeah. But I, for three years, I did sign with Dunlop, but they literally copied that head, head racket. But yeah, he, there you head go. prestige was. Yeah, head, I love. Yeah, yeah, head make a good racket. Yeah, I like this one. Hair or headpiece. <laughs> so, so, so is, 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 there, is there a certain hairstyle or a headpiece, like a headband that someone might? So who, like, could it be like a Kyrgios style, or could it be a Sissipas? Do you want the long locks, like? Oh, <laughs> well, I mean, I, <laughs> shit, man, I had both. I shaved my head. I had long hair with a bandana. What was it? Was it hard playing with long hair at times? No, I had the bandana. Yeah, true. It, it, it didn't matter. I liked I liked the lo- longer hair with the, I, you know, the bandana. Yeah, I, I like that. Yeah. And then next one is like confidence or we like to say swagger. So who's swagger? I'm sure you probably saw a few in the locker room your time. Who had real confidence? I think a lot of players had confidence. But swagger is something could also be, you know, like arrogance, arrogance as yeah. well. So I'm not going to... Um, you know what? Swagger, I guess, when someone kind of did a little bit of this because they walked a little differently. Boris Becker. Do you remember how yeah. he kind of used to walk a little, had that thing... Yeah, I love it. Becker. Becker. All right. What about temperament? So temperament who's on mindset? Would you like? I uh, can't say the same person twice. No. Okay, temperament. Um, God, there's some, you know, temperament. Someone who doesn't lose their cool. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, just look, you got to rock hard. About being pretty cool. Uh, temperament. Um, I mean, Stefan Edberg was an absolute gentleman yeah. on the court. I mean. He, I didn't. You don't see him too often lose it. I'd say Stefan Edberg. All right, and the, and the last one I've got is I actually like this one. Rig. So like someone physique, with physique, like real power. Uh, look, if you're talking about a great physique for tennis, or you're talking about going to the beach. <laughs> no, no, no. We're tennis. talking the beach. Oh, I was going to the beach. I'll be on the beach. Yeah. Um, give us both. Yeah, give no, us both. I don't, uh, look. Uh, I don't know if I was staring too much about the rig on the beach, you know, <laughs> boys. It might be a different sex for that. Um, on the, on yeah, we don't the, want to get you in trouble. On the court. 
look, these days, man, guys, are, the average height is almost 6'4", six, 6'5", six, and they move like they're 5'10". You know what I mean? Mm. You're, if you're looking at... um, I got to... Tell you how to... I was shocked. What was his name, the 18-year-old that played Novak in the first round this year? Um... Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the, he um, was the, the Croatian. Kid yeah, he also. was fit. Yeah, like, oh, a strong kid. Yeah. But then, you know, there's another. What's that guy's rig who he was <laughs> ripping it off last year, taking it off his shirt, and, and people were losing it? He had a crazy. His whole body was defined. But then, see, he didn't move as freely. But, look at, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but that you know makes what I mean? Sense. Like a little, little stiff. Yeah. But I mean, the way. Look, again. His body, but looking at a, a Djokovic, yeah. the way he moves and everything, yeah, that's yeah. an ideal. But look at the way Sinner moves. And then, I mean, yeah, Sinner. look, um, what's his name? Um, Tsitsipas. I mean, he's an incredible athlete. Mm. I mean, there's quite a few that I could say yeah. that are just amazing athletes. They're 6'4", 6'5", 6'6". They're six, six, yeah, tall. And they move like... Um, they're freaking 5'10", 5'9", you know? <laughs> they move like you. <laughs> no, I wish. I wish. Well, thank you for that, Mark. As, as taking part, we've got a special gift from our sponsors. So you've got a, if you'd like to take it up, we'll pass it on. But maybe as we create, we, we'll talk about them shortly or, or that. But um, the Virtual Expo has very generously gifted you a booth at the Virtual Expo. So this is a global two-day event online for all businesses all types of businesses um, to exhibit to thousands of people in one day. You can set up a booth and basically just have people come through all day. You don't have to be sitting there. You just set it up once. And it's online, isn't it? Online. It's amazing. What a great idea. Yeah. I haven't heard of this. Yeah, yeah. It's very, very, very niche, um, niche and, and quite new. Um, so just like you would at the Melbourne Showgrounds, go amazing. to an exhibition. It's all virtual and it's the exact same feel. So 16 touch points, which means you click around the booth. There's banners, tablecloths, and any information you'd like to give on your business. And people can actually request, hey, I'm at your booth. Do you want to have a live meeting? I want to talk to you about this, this, and this. And if cool. you accept, straight into a uh, Zoom meeting. That's, so It's a great segue, actually, to as we create. Fantastic um, concept. When is, has this been around for long? Yeah. No, only a couple of years. Yeah. But this so is coming up late, ma- late March, so 28th and 20, yeah. 27th and 28th of March, I should say. So What's two day called? event, the Virtual Expo, the Disruptor Expo. Expo. Yeah. So, yeah, no, so you've sounds got a free amazing. booth. So if you we'll uh, send me the details yeah. for that, please. Well, that it's, uh, it's on them for, uh, for taking part in this. But um, yeah. Thank so you, boys. You and your wife or girls. just started as we create. Was it It's last year? It's only typically two years ago. So, backstory. When I was living in San Diego, I created a t-shirt line, um, t-shirt brand. And it slowly went from there to fleece, but mostly tees. And I was in all the cool stores in LA, the Fred Siegel Man and all that kind of stuff. I was in, I don't know if you know this store called Barney's New York. Barney's New York is like, it was like the high, it's, it, you couldn't get as far as a department store. It was just the best brands in it. It was amazing. Seen it in movies. Unfortu- unfortunately, yeah. it, it, it it went bankrupt, but they had stores in Beverly Hills. They had six, seven stores, and I was in six, six stores of wow. theirs. Um, and and also Isetan Department Store in Japan is an amazing department store in Japan. And and it just started growing, you know. And and I was very, I'm very passionate. I have a very creative side to me. I've always drawn as a kid, and I love drawing and things like that. So I have a creative side, and and I love clothes, and I just used that, and I ended up becoming a great source of of using my creativity you know mm. itching that part and i just love clothes and i just wanted to create something that was comfortable and and that i felt like was missing as far as what i was looking for when i was looking to buy clothes so fabric was the most important thing for me and it was made in la and so i started getting to all these cool stores um and then when my son was born i kind of stopped you know driving to la sometimes the traffic would take you should be like a 50 minutes would take freaking three hours, one way, three hours, the other, and I was, what? and my son was born, just, you know, the gridlock sometimes with that, you know, after work, and my son was born, mm-hmm. I just, my my heart, obviously my priority completely, everything was completely changed, and I just didn't want to waste, my time was so precious to, to spend that time with him, I didn't want to waste it on being in the car, stuck in traffic, so that kind of, I stopped that brand, and then, Justin Bieber was caught one, wearing one of my tees, and oh, I guess there's somebody wow. that follows him that would put what is he wearing, you know, like on Instagram, and then people just started reaching out, and it kind of went nuts. And I was like, I, I just don't, I don't make it anymore. Sorry, guys, 
which is kind of weird. Then oh, so there was so much. There was so many people wanting the product. Well, there were, you know, you imagine yeah. him wearing yeah. one of your products <laughs> and Holy people shit. riding yeah. it. Yeah. Picked a better person, pictures yeah. of him wearing. And then, wow, because I had a he got caught wearing one of my tees. He was my my V neck tee. But if you go online, I, I created because the T-shirts I created, I, I created the patterns for all my pieces, and the, my tees are self-binding tees, which means it's not a typical crew like you guys have. Like it's a, like a rib. Yeah. Like it, the, it's actually the same fabric, but it's just folded over with a very fine, just a very simple, clean stitch. So I, it, the, the neck is a touch more open, um, not as restricting, and more of a European vibe as far as a tee, but not open where it's like a full-on. Mykonos t-shirt if you're on the beach <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know down at Paradise Beach over there you know um, the chest hair yeah, yeah. But, but it was just touch more comfortable and I created a, a, a v-neck where it was the same design but it doesn't have a stitch on the bottom normally v-necks have a stitch and it doesn't have a stitch so the um, the factory is it would be a pain in the ass to make because you know because it doesn't have that stitch not so simple and I wanted it to be in a certain length and and not look like a U it still had to be a V shape but I didn't want that stitching there so it was very not that easiest to make and he wore that he had that T and I had a pocket on it you know and it's very obvious it was my T it was a pocket V um, and I guess yeah, you know I got it one of those stores in LA one of these people um, and anyway so I went nuts and I just yeah, just didn't do anymore. And I just knew once I moved back to Australia and we got settled in, I always wanted to create a brand again, like a clothing line. But I made so many mistakes the first time, as you do mm. when you don't know anything and then taken advantage of by a lot of things. And I'm like, I know I want to create something again. And and when I was looking into it, I thought, okay, I want it to be made. I want everything made in, in, in Australia and, and preferably Melbourne only because I lived in Melbourne. So I wanted to drive to the factory to, yeah. to quality control to check and everything like that so you know i created a brand it's called as we create and i actually registered the name for something else another business that i didn't end up doing with my best friend and i just love the name and i had it um uh, you know i had it registered and yeah had it protected okay, and i'm like yeah. i'm just gonna use this you know yeah so you've had the name for a while i've had the name yeah, for a okay. while and and it was for something else and i'm like god as we create i kind of like the name the other name i had was for my other t-shirt line was flip which was my nickname mm. um so i created t-shirts and, and i'm like fabric is the most important thing and i the fabric is obviously the yarn is not made here because no yarns are made in australia everything's made overseas but it's custom knit for me here and it's 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 all using organic it's got certified organic cotton and i get it pre-washed pre-shrunk and i get it softened so all the pieces were ethically made here you know are ethically made in, in melbourne with with fabric that's um, knit here mm. in as well, um, ethically, you know, made as well. And the t-shirts are just everyday lu luxury basics, you know, there's no logo on them. Um, t-shirts are incredibly comfortable. You said they're pre-washed, pre-shrunk, and they're soft, so every time you get them out of the dryer, they feel even softer. The fleece. Um, I like the sound I, of that. I, I, it's, I it's swear. Like when like I'm wearing the fleece, they're super yeah. comfortable, they're softened, you know, pre-washed, pre-shrunk, you know, because I've bought, t I've bought, a uh, sweatshirt from going for Byron Bay, for instance, and there's beautiful stores in there, and it's a well-known brand. I would buy it and spend 120 bucks on this sweatshirt. I'd wear it two, three times, and it would shrink. Yeah, it'd be a medium, and I'm like, you're spending 120 dollars on something. It should not shrink. It should not warp. You know what I mean? Yeah. It should just last for freaking years. So, I would just it frustrate me, you know, and <laughs> I just wanted to, and so I. I the stuff, look, it's it's not, it's classic styling and classic pieces that was. It's not fast fashion. It just can last for years. Um, the 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 samples I made five years ago still fit me, and I still wear them because they just last, you know. And and but more importantly, is number one, I don't want to sell anything for like a hoodie for two hundred dollars for a fleece for two hundred dollars. Who can afford to be spending hundred dollars on a tee? Two hundred dollars now. You're a well-known brand. You're a luxury brand. Different story. They know. You know. They've. You know. You're spending money on that. But who's going to spend money on? Even though that's kind of what they should be priced at, because it's very expensive to be made in Australia and using yeah. got certified organic cotton. You know, my the probably seven eight dollars a meter the fabric. Yeah. And then it's organically and ethically made here. It's incredibly expensive. But I'm like, okay, I'm going to go straight to consumer. 
you know, I don't want anything over a hundred dollars. That's my goal. I don't want to put anything over a hundred. So my t-shirts are seventy dollars. Yep. You know, but yeah, almost over twenty five dollars to make the tees here ethically. You mm. know, so it's not 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 yeah. cheap. You know, the f- fleeces and the hoodies are over fifty dollars, but they're you know my my hoodies are at ninety eight dollars. You know, the the jogger pants are at ninety eight, even though it cost me over fifty to do. You know. That is very So you're, you're, you're trying to make quality accessible. I'm making literally the best quality you can with the best fabric you can. Yeah. But, but I want it to be, I don't want to say affordable because people think just because it's affordable, the quality is not there. At just at the best, at, at, at the pricing that they can't get. You know, yeah. Because I'm direct to consumer, I can do that. Mm. I'm not in a store. Normally you, you make a t-shirt for $25. You have a store. Normally you buy for me for fifty, and then you sell it for a hundred. Yeah. Mm. I double my money, you double your money, but I don't want to be, you know, I just want to be straight to consumer. So it's just your luxury basics that's ethically made here. It just feel good, and, and and that's that's what it is. Although I'm wearing now the movement tee, I have created the first apparel, uh, first active line. The future of this brand for me is active lifestyle brand. It's going to move more to the active lifestyle. So that's going to change. But again, nothing is going to be over $100. You know, and, and, and my wife right now is designing the women's line because technically all the stuff were men's. Yeah, even okay. though 60% of the people buying my stuff are women. Yeah, okay. Women love to wear a man's t or a man's they? hoodie and that's why I ended up making <laughs> they really do. an extra yeah. small. So I'm like, God, it's stupid for me not to focus on a woman's line. Let's let's be honest. They're the ones who are really focused on what they wear. And, and so my wife is designing that she actually went to school for fashion um and so she's right now in the middle of redesigning the women's leggings um bike shorts sports bra and uh, a proper you know tee incredibly comfortable t-shirt for women um you know with some fleece as well so that's going to be available in the next probably three months it's exciting next three months so how do we how do we find it have for it's listening. just online on as we create.com beautiful um is 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 the store online and <laughs> i'm gonna go have a look tonight honestly and, yeah. uh and i i was so rushed that i i wanted to ask the boys for your send me your your sizing and i would love to send you some stuff oh, thanks, oh that'd be thanks amazing. Mark. For, for, for everyone thank you um but uh well i'll, yeah. I'll say this because i I love a plain tee. Like yeah, I just yeah. wear plain tees all the time, but I feel like I'm constantly buying them, like over and over and over for like the <laughs> six dollar target. Well, no, no, I well, I won't mention mention the brand, but it's a pretty well known yeah. brand. It's actually a tennis brand. Like, Would or they was shrink? It? No, no, I'm I'm, it? I'm finding it. I'm always getting things on them. Like they're going in the wash, and maybe I'm putting in the wrong things. Mm. I don't know, but. Some of them shrink, but I think oh, they. What happens when the stitching comes out and you yeah, get that's, stuff? Yeah, that's quality. That's, okay, that's 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 some, that's the way. That's production. Okay, that's quality with the stitching. Because I feel like I'm always um, ripping off, like de- depending on what you know, cotton they're using mm. for stitching. They're using 100% cotton for even the stitching, like mm. you know. So that's just comes down to what I said, quality control. Yeah, you know, um, and I think that's uh, that's a huge important part to it. Is is lasting like i said i've made a sample that's you know because i was making samples a year before we launched with two years now in this brand and they're th- four years old and and they still they feel amazing you know even softer they've got new sides they haven't shrunk they haven't warped um and it's it's important of yeah. quality you know and, and but the funny that's funny how you say that because i had someone reach out on on the instagram like 70 dollar tees what a joke and I'm like, remember, I'm like, okay, don't reply, just breathe. <laughs> yeah. you know? And I thought, this is a customer. I understand, like, let's understand where that person's coming from. Things are expensive, you yeah. know. And I'm like, and I remember replying um, as gentle as possible to this person. I'm like, okay, I, I said, I totally get where you're coming from. $70 is not cheap. Um, goes because you go because that person said I can get a, a something from Kmart for twenty. I said absolutely you can, and probably even cheaper. I go, so let's look at what you're buying. You're going to spend $20, $25 on that tee. I guarantee you within a year, you'd have to buy four or five of these T-shirts to last for the year, right? Or you spend $75 on a quality tee. It's got certified organic cotton, pre-shrunk, pre-washed and softened. That will last you three years. So 
when I ever, like, every time I post something at the bottom, I say, buy better, buy less. I yeah. don't want you to buy a yeah. hundred of my tees. No. Buy one. Yeah. Or buy, if you love it, buy the same one in a couple of different colors. It's going to last you years. Not only that, you know, every time you come home, I'm going to go to it because it's comfortable. Like, I want you to buy less. Mm. Yes, I want to sell more. It's a business. I need to make money, right? I need to evolve. The brand needs to build. But the difference is if you buy right, you just need to buy once. I don't, it's like with anything else, you, you know, spend a little bit more, but you know it's going to last, you know. So true. Makes total sense. It's, um, it's interesting hearing you talk about that. I'm like, and again, we, we haven't really touched on it, but I mean, we, as viewers of tennis or, or watchers of tennis, when you, we see and hear about the glitz and the glamour of some players, like the, the top echelon, and, they, and you said they bring their entourage with them overseas. But what's it like for players that, on the lower end of the scale and they're really almost gambling to to fly around the world and and make certain rounds like because that's a big reality of tennis that we don't hear about i don't know if you were ever in a position maybe when you were starting i know i mean you sprung up very quickly as a teenager but what's it like if you're under actual financial pressure to win matches to qualify to continue on man you're, you're spot on it is brutal when these guys if you're in a top 100 and if you can get into a Grand Slam, let's just say you get into a Grand Slam. If you lost first round this year at the Australian Open, it was 90 grand. <laughs> 90. Can you believe that? When you lost first round when I was playing, it was 7,900, 8,000. <laughs> so let's just say you get into all four Grand Slams, you mm. lose first round of yep. all four. It's almost a 400 grand. Man. Yes, you take out the taxes and all that. That helps you big time. Mm. If you win one match... When it went to 170, yeah, one. I mean, 170. I think, jeez, I lost in the final U.S. Open. I, I don't know, man. I, I, I want to say be lucky to be over 200 there. I don't know. I can't remember what it was. Honestly, I can't yeah. remember. For being runners up, yeah, yeah. You know, wow. Now, in the final, over, yeah. You know that that's that was 19. That was 98. Okay, um, quite a while ago. But you lose, in the, <laughs> you lose in the final now. You know, what is it? 1.2? I don't know. Yeah. 1.3. I'm not sure. So, you know, so things have changed. But if you're out of that top 100 where you can't get into the ATP and you're on the Challenger Tour, let's just say, yeah. and you're 200-ish in the world, 300, where you can't get into 250 ATP events, but those guys win the events. They may be getting 5K challenges, maybe three and a half, maybe bigger one, um, you know, 100 Plus H means that if you win the tournament, you're getting 100 points to win, which is great. Mm -hmm. Plus H, plus hospitality. So I'll pay for your thing. And then I don't know what the the thing is, 7,500. But if you play for an airplane to get there, if you've got a coach Mm -hmm. and you're paying for your hotel and his hotel, you're lucky to break even. Like you have to win the tournament and you might get one grand in the pocket too. That's the reality. So you need to get out of those things as soon as possible, you know. That's the, you can't be stuck on those in the challenger level. You need to get on the tour, and I was very lucky. Look, I when um, I lost in the final. It's the final of, of Wimbledon Juniors when I was seventeen. At, at the age of seventeen, after the semis, I signed a five year contract with Filler. Very lucky. If I did not sign that after I signed that five year contract with Filler, that was the last junior tournament I played. I traveled with my dad to all the biggest tournaments in the world, not playing challengers qualifying trying to play qualifying just playing qualifying where he had to win two or three matches to get into the main draw yeah okay and i was very lucky the fact that that next year i i was five for 600 in the world i lost in the final of a tournament when i was eight just turned 18 in november that after Australian open that march i played scottsdale lost in the final to jim courier ranking went to 130 then ended up losing the final to um semi-final to rios in the clay court tournament around 110 then I played Japan indoors, which is a huge million dollar indoor event. I lost to uh, Chang in the final that next week. I lost to Rios in the final of Kuala Lumpur and I went to 32 in the world. I finished. Wow. But I mean, I had some big, yeah. big results and I was very lucky that I wasn't in the challenger level, you know. Um, but I, I, was, I didn't have to worry about that because I had that sponsor Mm. You know, so that's why, you know, I say, yeah. if I did not have that sponsor, there's no way I'll be able to travel with my dad to even play the challenger level, to be honest with you. That's just the reality. My family didn't have the money to pay to go overseas, thousands of dollars in plane tickets. And then because we lived in Australia, where are you going to base yourself? You have to be in a hotel. You've got to pay for a hotel. 
Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Where are you going to go? So a lot, what's happening now, these challenges, if, and these guys are great players, on off season, that will be coaching at a club. Wow. Saving money. And then like, okay, now I can go out and play some tournaments. That's, really? That's a hundred percent. And that's why you, you, you're so, thank goodness, you're hearing you're vocally with the ATP saying that they, they're trying to get more money in the challenger level to support these guys because I know how tough it is. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you need, that's just the reality. Unfortunately, that's just the reality of sports. That's, it's mm. just, that's real life. If you're not in that, people mm. only see what they see because they hear grand slams and all the money there and all the money. Yes, if you're in that certain level, and even the guys who are eight in the world, they might, most of these guys don't have sponsors. They'll get close for free. Don't think they're getting paid hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm. Even if you're top 10, uh, you know, I think they gave out bigger contracts when I played. Not bigger, but more guys had multi-million dollar contracts. Now, only a handful are getting over a million dollars a year. A handful. Yes, those top three guys, whatever it is, they might be getting 10, 15, 12 million dollars. I don't know what it is. But even the guy's nine in the world, he's probably getting half a million dollars. Maybe, I don't know, maybe more, 750. Not millions. Mm. And the guy is 30, 40 in the world, I guarantee he's not getting more than 200K. I guarantee, there's no, I guarantee you. It's crazy. Because like, I look at like, and you say like 600 in the world tennis or globally, where I look at like the 600th AFL player in the league. They don't have to, they at least could base themselves in the country. They don't have to pay probably all these expenses and they're probably getting paid a lot more right. versus 600 tennis player in the entire world. No, no, he's getting nothing. Yeah. Well, and that player might not even play. Yeah. You 100%. Know, you know, whereas, did you know people, I mean, the tour, I don't know, was everyone on tour when you were playing friends? Did you know challenger, were you friends with challenger type players who were in that bracket? No. Okay. No. Um, like I said, I was very lucky. Yeah. I, you know, I worked hard for it. I mean, yeah, but of course. I got the results, but I maybe played one or two challenges when I was 16, 15, yeah. 16. Um, I, I didn't. Didn't play. It didn't play. You know, I played one actually when I was injured, making my comeback, and I ended up winning it. Of course, it was like five. I didn't even pay for any. It was five grand. I, I played for the match play. I needed match yeah. play, and in the great ended up getting some points. You know, mm. ended up being a hundred points when you you come back from injury. That helped. You know, that made a difference too. But it was just for me to get match play. Like there's some players that are top hundred play challenges. But it's because they just want to match play. There's nothing on, and they want some matches. You know, because mm. they they've not feeling good with their, with their game or they want extra matches and, and on a losing streak or come back from injury. It's, yeah. it's crazy because like, I, I, like I think about, um, oh fuck, I just lost my train of thought. It's gone now. Jeez, boys, I can't work like this. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I completely forgot what I was going to say. Oh no. <laughs> boys, I can't work like this. Uh, I got a question about the, like the entourage. I don't know if the entourage has changed over the years, but because of social media, people want, to be around you because of the the high life or not necessarily the high life but the profile you get so maybe I can latch on to hangers on as yeah, yeah hanger on was that <coughs> was that a thing when you were playing did you cop right, any of that there were always there was people around they, um, you know I lived in Florida in Miami back in the time but I you know my priority growing up I knew from a very young age was family yeah you know who I surrounded who was real who I could you know, who was loyal, who I can count on, who I loved, who, who had my back, I had their back. So it was my family and I had a very small circle of friends, very, very small circle, it fit in one hand. Um, so I had those people, we protected each other, they protected me, you know, um, I was very lucky to have that. So I knew, you can, I, I knew who was around me for, for what reason, you know, and, and kept them at a distance and, and it was very, was polite to them, but, but, you know, made sure I didn't allow them in my circle. You know what I mean? Arm's length. Yeah. 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 So now should we go to yeah. our golf box segment? You, you'll wake up tonight and go, that's what I fucking <laughs> wanted to <laughs> say. And then, you, know, I know. you know what? It's absolutely killing me. I'm Probably so the best question of the day too, you know. Oh, uh, yeah. Maybe I'll DM it to you. <laughs> 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 um, do you want to read that? Yeah, perfect. Uh, What's in the golf box is brought to you by our good friends at Golf Box, Australia's greatest golf superstore. If you need it, they have it and it gets to you fast and free. Shop online at golfbox.com.au. Do you want to explain the game? Mark, welcome to the golf box. As you can see, it's uh, a very humble box, but uh, inside it contains a lot of treasures. Um, So inside there, there's probably about 10 questions or challenges. 
Um, they're random and uh, basically all you have to do is pull one out, read us a question and just uh, answer it or complete the challenge and, and there'll be a little surprise for you uh, once you do. So I think it's time, Mark. What's right. in the golf box? I didn't expect to pull out anything in this day, <laughs> but I'll pull it out for you. Let's see. What's this? What's the dumbest injury you've given yourself? Oh, that's a good one. I am reckon you might have it. Think about when you were a kid too. Surely you did some stuff playing. Oh, um, well, I mean, this was painful and, and, and uh, it stopped me from warming up. I had to... Oh, no, that wasn't the dumbest one. No. <laughs> no, that wasn't He's the thinking. dumbest one. No. My God, how can I forget this one? 98, I lost in the final of US Open. It was 99. I was, it was in New York. I was getting ready. And, and I, I've told you guys I love basketball. A lot of my warm-up is basketball. And there was a huge gymnasium, wharf, gym area, like in the city where they've got a huge indoor running track. There's an area for yoga and your weights and your cardio. And then they've got basketball courts, volleyball courts. And and I saw these guys, they were playing a pickup game. And I was waiting, I ended up playing a pickup game. Oh, no. <laughs> and I love them. And I went in, I... I and I was on this guy and ended up scoring something and, and ended up getting the rebound <laughs> off another play. And then I went up um, for another rebound and that the guy shoved me and I came down and landed on oh, he tunneled someone. you. Yeah. Yes, it landed on somebody and rolled my ankle. I had to pull out of the US Open. <laughs> <laughs> that bad where I had to pull out of the US Open. Um, the year after as well. That was and I and I was coming, but I had to, you know, I what, lost finals year before. What did so you tell I, the media? I'm trying to, I, I didn't. I, um, so, I mean, I had to, you know, just the agents had to say. I remember, oh fuck, uh, I was l- walking. I'm like, oh, you know where you kind of do. I'm like, oh my god, I think this is bad. You're not sure. Mm. And then like an hour later, it was, and the the day later, I woke up and it was swollen oh. and I couldn't walk. And I'm like, oh, fuck, I cannot play the U.S. Open. This was like three days before. So I pulled out, you know, and I felt bad enough. I remember I felt bad enough and I flew back to Florida where I was living. Um, and I remember watching TV and John McEnroe's commentating the match. And he was like, you know, so we didn't talk about it. And I, so my name came up. And how about this one? Mark Philippoussis <laughs> ends up pulling out of the Australian <laughs> Open because of a, a twisted ankle. And look and listen how he did it. I was playing basketball. <laughs> I mean, what was this guy thinking? How could they let him just ripping me apart? I'm like, I'm already like sitting on the couch. I've got my like, foot up, you yeah. know, miserable. <laughs> you know, can't even try to, you know, get those points for yeah. have a run for it again. And he's ripping me. And he just made me feel even worse. <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, that is unbelievable. So, what a um, great story. Well, you know what? One of the no, one of the pretty freaking stupid. One oh. of the challenges in there is actually impersonate a celebrity. So he's done two <laughs> he's in one. He's done two in one. Um, but because of that, Mark, here's a two hundred fifty dollar oh, yeah. voucher to our yeah, good friends at Golf Box. Fast there and free. Go. Do you like golf? Go. I do. I do. I used to play a fair bit of golf. Did you? But, um, and then as with well, two kids, man, I don't have time for five of hours. But when I travel though, I'm, I'm playing. I used to play, I used to play once a week and then would play uh, events and I try and play some charity events. I love playing. I love golf. Yeah. yeah well, just I love playing. You guys play? Not very well. We freaking well, should, well, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. No, we, we, we have a hit uh, and we, we're, we're trying to get better you. because of them. You know, good, we're, good. we're representing them. So. Well, actually, Mitch, um, Mitch, who you saw yesterday, Craig, he, he came on and he said um, his first question when we handed him his little prize, he said, does Golf Box do lessons? So uh, we're, we're, we're in that category <laughs> as well. Right. But actually, just quickly before we sign off, did you spend a long time in a wheelchair? In your yeah, during, like, three months. So after my third surgery, I had, it, was a, it was a lateral meniscal tear, but also microfracture surgery. And a microfracture surgery is right here, right? You've, um, my head bone on bone. So they had to um, pick a hole, not drill, but pick with a tool called a ewer, and literally just getting a pointy thing and a hammer and just hammering a hole inside oh. the bone. And then that bone, why uh, it, was, it was three months, three months on the wheelchair and three months on crutches. And they said I'll never play tennis again professional. It was a 2001. Um, and then that has to bleed out. So one wheelchair, it's non-weight bearing because you've got to give it an opportunity to bleed. And when it bleeds out, it hardens. And that's supposed to create like um, a cartilage like over the bone. Um, mm. 
And then I also I was taking Synvisc injections, which is synthetic cartilage injections, because I haven't got I've got like fifty percent of cartilage in my knees. I don't have hundred right. percent, so there's a lot of wear and tear. Um, and so yeah, so it was I was incredibly depressed, and and um, I remember being in the wheelchair, and then my dad would organize things like get a Tai Chi master to come and do stuff in a chair for for mentally, because yeah, I was yeah. incredibly not only I would I love. You know, you lost your freedom, but just I, I used to love riding motorbikes. I have I was an adrenaline junkie and rode, rode my motorbikes or go on a jet ski or snowboard or um, I was very active. I couldn't sit still. I was going that guy. So surf, I, surf then? So, no, I was wakeboarding, wake wake skating. Yeah. I was living in Miami Beach before I surfed, and um, so mentally I was depressed. You know, struggling sure. mentally big time, and so I started doing that. And then one morning he woke up. I woke up and he had sawn off the armrests of the wheelchair and we went on the court and we started training. You know, I started oh, yeah. hitting forehands wow. to, hit four to me. Backhands was hard, of course. It was yeah. But that way, and then I used to have uh, close friends come over and we would play doubles and, and I would, so I'd just, I would try and get on the court and train while I was in the wheelchair and ended up, that was 2001, so I ended up having my best year 2003. So incredible. You can always um, come back from anything. I love how he sawed them off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just I remember I came off, and I'm you not know, buying a new one. No, no yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Old school, baby. So yeah, old school. Love it. Well, yeah. Mark, thank you so much, firstly, because uh, thank you for making the the trip down to Melbourne today. We really, really appreciate your time. Um, it's honestly a massive honour for us both um, mm. to have you. So we really appreciate it. Thank you for being so open, so humble, um, having a laugh with us, playing along. Um, we appreciate it, and um, yeah, we. Yeah, that's all I can say. Thank Fair you. Time, boys. It was absolutely my pleasure. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Mark. Awesome setup here too.